Okay, so it's, uh, my name's uh, Dr. Gulam Bahadur. I'm a consultant clinical andrologist, and I have a, a very a strong interest in intrauterine insemination. Today, what I'm going to talk to you about is give you 10 secret tips on how to improve your success rates in intrauterine insemination. Let me begin by asking you one thing. What are you doing to improve the success rates within your clinic? Now, when it, within these talks, we have roughly about 2,000 people who are viewing the talks. How about sharing what you have done with us uh, in the meantime? And encourage me to give you a more advanced talk on the same thing which I've already prepared but I'll await and try and incorporate some of your ideas also. So here we, be, here we go. The first point is do you understand the patient? This is so vital. You have the classical picture of a pie chart and that pie chart tells you uh, what your distribution is. But it is within your own clinic, if you are not collecting the data, as to then that distribution is not the same as what the classical picture shows. In one extreme case, I have found that they classified most of the, uh, their patients with severe oligosuospermia with a view to justifying ICSI. Now that's one extreme view. <coughs> now the second vital, uh, so your secret uh, tip is uh, your stimulation protocol. Change it to GNRH analogs. Uh, 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 that, and the reason is that moving G, sorry, GNRH uh, protocols purely because over the years what we have found is that the clomid induced uh, cycles have really yielded very low pregnancy rates and when we moved over to 75 um, IU GnRH and then we moved on to 150 we saw a massive leap in the pregnancy outcomes there. The third thing is aim for two to three follicles and you won't believe it <coughs> that really uh, going from one follicle to two follicle increases your pregnancy rate 3.4 fold theoretically it may not always be so purely because of the, of the pathology of your patients but it, believe you me it will increase your pregnancy rates of course you will have this concern that does it not increase your multiple births this is not the case we have had now five years of consistently low uh, multiple births uh, I I within two clinics that I'm helping out with. Now with this also you need a ver the fourth point is that you need a very strict cancellation policy because in terms of success you do not want multiple births B you don't want OHSS so those are the two vital ingredients so factored into your success is also that you need to uh, re make sure that you have a strict cancellation policy. Now, the fifth tip is that in some s very difficult patients, we have been using combination therapy using GnRH and Clomid, and it's amazing what type of results we have been getting in some of the patients over the age of 35 and very difficult with very long periods of infertility. The, I can express that the pregnancy rates have been quite amazing. <clears throat> in about 70 cycles uh, that I analyzed fairly recently, the pregnancy rate was something like 27% per cycle, and roughly 38% of the women were getting pregnant. And that is not a bad figure for an over 35 age band. As the sixth point that I want to raise is the timing of IUI. It is so vital that you get this one right. I know that between 24 and 36 hours, everyone's uh, trying to perform those inseminations. We have got all, virtually all our pregnancies, most of our pregnancies actually have been um, uh, around uh, 29 hours. But it also 
I hope that in my more advanced talk uh, next time, when I also have a bit of more information from all you guys at that end, I will show you how single and double uh, inseminations uh, actually work because all the data that was gathered for the sing uh, for the double insemination and what Cochrane has to say is in my view redundant. Redundant because the, most of the data was generated using Clomid. In fact, uh, from, the, um, from the new data that I can show you is that what, what is actually happening is that uh, double inseminations do work for GN average. Uh, induced uh, cycles. The uh, s seventh uh, tip that I can give you is that often the question arises, should you, should you allow them to have sexual intercourse? And the question is, why not? You know, after the insemination, have for heaven's sake, let them have intercourse, you know? Uh, it's not going to disrupt anything. And um, in, in some of the uh, Oh, uh, just to go back on the sixth point, uh, point number six, is that when I analyzed the data, our Monday insemination provided the worst pregnancies, and that means it meant that our weekend management was not very good. I'm sorry for backtracking, and I will come back to point number seven. I said sexual intercourse. I, I would encourage sexual intercourse as much as uh, they can after the insemination. Point number eight is, is bed rest advisable? There's conflicting data. The, the short answer is why not? You know, are you, is there anything, does it cost you anything to allow the woman to, to rest for 15, 20 minutes? No. It, if you don't have time uh, for that patient, does it mean that you don't have time for anything else for that patient? Look at your results very carefully. Point number nine male factor. I, you, do you really understand what you, you, you're talking about when you come to male factor? What is uh, severe male factor? What is uh, not so male? Uh, what, what sort of grade of male factor are you talking about? And I think people are regurgitating the WHO guidelines as if that will translate into pregnancies. No, it does not. The WHO guidelines were based on men with proven pregnancies. We actually know very little about patients um, who are undergoing uh, subfertility treatment. That's why I urge you to look at each and individual patient very carefully. And I have introduced the concept of consecutive ejaculation for you. And my tenth tip is do you really know what you're doing in your clinic? Do you have a database? No, you don't have a database. If you don't have a database, how are you going to follow what is going on? So I hope that that, uh, in fact, just, I have had spent considerable time in trying to develop a very advanced database. It tells me a hell of a lot of what's going on. And in real time, it tells me whether we are functioning well as a clinic or not. And I think this is quite important. So just other tips is that the, it, what it leads me on to is just to finalize what I really do want to say. Um, and that is um, the way forward we should be saying, do all what you can to achieve pregnancies as early as possible. Um, each cycle is very important for the patient. Remember that they're putting a lot of emotional attachment to it. Analyze why patients do not get pregnant. Now, that is what databases can tell you, and then you can track back and see what your database tells you. It also tells you why do they not get pregnant, and that is a very vital piece of information. Communication, that is vital. I have, between the stakeholders, you've got the patients, you've got the doctor, the nurses, and the lab and everyone else. I actually put the nurses right in the center because they're the interface of everything. And I place a lot of emphasis on, uh, on nurses because I can gain so much information by simply talking to the nurses and tweaking or advising doctors to tweak the protocols if need be. Um, 
finally, just rem to remind you, patients are there to have a baby. So do what you can to give them a baby. Thank you.